In her book Feminism and Psychoanalytic Theory, Nancy Chodorow tackles some of the most critical and enduring questions in the ongoing dialogue between psychoanalysts and feminists. She approaches these questions from the dual perspective of both an analyst and a feminist, providing a unique and multifaceted viewpoint. The book is structured into an introduction and 10 chapters. organized into three parts in the introduction she explains her initial turn to anthropology in search of explanations for gender inequality rooted in social relations she subsequently embraced psychoanalysis to gain deeper insights into the emotional and conflictual components within cultural categories and practices she now asserts that a comprehensive feminist understanding demands a multifaceted account of gender dynamics sexuality sexual inequality and domination recognizing that gender is a phenomenon shaped by social cultural and psychological forces chodorow's ideas have evolved over time shifting from the earlier notion that women's mothering practices were the causes of defensive male reactions and male dominance She now proposes a more complex understanding acknowledging that gender development and inequality have multiple causes. She also explores the idea that men's lifelong need to differentiate themselves from the mother and maintain distance from the pre-edipal mother contributes to their preoccupation with sharp boundaries, categories, classifications and differences. Eventually She raises thought-provoking questions about whether the preoccupation with gender differences is intertwined with this broader orientation toward delineating boundaries. Part 1 of the book titled The Significance of Women's Mothering of Gender Personality and Gender Relations contains chapters penned during mid 1970s and early 1980s predating her seminal work The Reproduction of Mothering. In these early chapters she introduces her initial ideas about how women's mothering practices impact family structure and the development of feminine personality while some of these concepts have surfaced in existing literature she elevates them to a prominent position in her work for example she emphasizes the strength of a girl's pre-edipal connection with her mother and her less conclusive resolution of the edipal conflict compared to boys moreover she explores ideas that have since gained widespread acceptance such as gender based distinctions in attachment and separation patterns as well as the asymmetrical nature of the edipal relationship this asymmetry is characterized by the intensity of the mother daughter bond in contrast to the less dominant connection between the girl and her father The girl retains her pre-edipal tie to her mother while forming an attachment to her father that never becomes exclusive. Part 2 titled Gender, Self and Social Theory broadens the scope to encompass various facets of the self and delves into the intricate integration of different psychoanalytic theories related to gender. She argues for a relational origin of gender references rooted in object relations theory. Her focus centers on the development of the self where the primary objective is not just the formation of ego boundaries and a body ego but crucially the creation of an unconscious emotionally charged representation of others in relation to oneself a kind of internal self concept within the context of relationships she pioneers this concept which has subsequently been embraced in the self in relation theories developed by stone sender her perspective underscores the idea that the self incorporates unconscious representations of others including the mother and the mothering relationship the importance of understanding relational differences and their internalization in the context of gender and gender differences consistently permeates her work part 3 titled psychoanalysis psychoanalysis and feminism brings together the perspectives and positions of psychoanalysis and feminism from freud's era to the present 
She condensed that feminist critique has been both rich and thought-provoking and that psychoanalysis can offer valuable insights into how individuals undergo the processes of gendering and sexualization as well as how nature evolves into culture. While this section serves to clarify the concerns and points of contention among feminists, psychoanalytic feminists and psychoanalysis, it is important to note that it might inadvertently represent psychoanalysis as somewhat monolithic, with limited variability in positions and controversies. Nevertheless, this section contributes significantly to unraveling the complexities and disagreements among these various intellectual perspectives providing valuable clarity for those navigating these intricate debates. In a particularly thought-provoking chapter centered on psychoanalytic feminism and the psychoanalytic psychology of women, she skillfully delineates the contrasting positions of psychoanalytic feminists and psychoanalysts who have delved into the subject of women, all the while advocating for an ongoing dialogue between these groups. It's worth considering whether boundaries that once seemed so distinct among these factions remain as rigid as they were when this chapter was originally penned. Over time, elements from object relations theory have become integrated into mainstream psychoanalysis and insights derived from infant observation have catalyzed the reformulation of developmental concepts. It is increasingly evident that individuals' experiences are inevitably filtered through their self-images, which encompass gender awareness. Moreover, it is recognized that the cultural context in which males and females are raised significantly differ. In the final chapter of her book, she delves into a study which she conducted in the 1970s, during which she became aware of the significant presence of prominent women psychoanalysts compared to women in other professions. She conducted interviews with women from the older generation of psychoanalysts and offers insights into what might account for the decline in the number of women entering the field in subsequent generations. In this context, she raises an important methodological question regarding the implications of the lack of gender awareness among this group of women in contrast to her own experiences. She concludes that her own ideas were shaped by different social conditions than those of her subjects, who tended to compartmentalize their public and domestic interpretations of gender, maintaining conventional attitudes in one sphere while denying gender consciousness in the other. She suggests that cultural and historical processes play a pivotal role in shaping the likelihood of particular conceptualizations prevailing over others.